Hi, everybody. I'll begin to welcome you as you begin to enter and the numbers start to, to climb. So uh, it's good morning on one side and uh, good day on the South African side, but you'll take the, the uh, greeting appropriate to you. So welcome to day two, welcome to this panel, which is decolonization and feminist voices. Uh, we're looking forward to and hoping for a panel that is uh, suitably uh, provocative and evocative. And we have a, a exciting lineup for you which is asymmetrical in, in the best possible way, because it is a panel where there is a postdoc um, experienced or established rather researchers, um, new emerging academics. So it is a lovely mixed voice. And you can see by the way we've labeled the panel that we are looking for what is obvious, a polyvocality. Um, so without... Uh, Dwelling too much more, let me jump into the first speaker, who's Rosalind Kanyembe. And Rosalind is one of our School of Social Sciences alumni. I know her supervisor intimately, and that's an inside joke, but Rosalind will know what I mean by that. And she is now a postdoc fellow in HERD, which is, and let me get this right, Health Economics, HIV and AIDS Research Division. Her PhD, which wasn't too... too long ago was in a topic around misogyny and sexist humor and she is drawing from that for this presentation uh, the topic the title of her presentation is higher education spaces as radical sites for female resistance a case of the case of Great zimbabwe university so rosalind we are looking forward to your presentation i just want to quickly reiterate your q a please post into the q a box and to remind all the speakers here to be mindful of the time and the clock. Over to you, uh, Rosalind. Oh, as I know you, Rose. Good morning, everyone. As Professor Maya said, my name is Rosalind Kanyemba. Allow me to present to you uh, the findings from a study uh, I did not long ago. Uh, it's titled Higher Education Spaces as a radical sites for female resistance, a case of the uh, Great Zimbabwe University. So a little background of the study. Uh, the study discusses uh, expressions of the female voice in response to sexist humor at a university in Zimbabwe. The study approaches a uh, female response through African feminist lenses, which recognizes that uh, Patriarchal domination is one thing African women have in common, uh, despite their differences in religion, politics, and others. Uh, in light of this study, uh, the study uh, explores how women's substantive voice is suppressed in an environment which is perceived to be equal and all inclusive. Uh, the study seeks to illuminate the female students' voice in reclamation of higher education space, which has been deemed by a strong patriarchal tradition of violence against women, aggravated by misogyny and denying them equal and quality access to higher education. All this despite the fact that public higher education continues to remain the main route to career advancement for many women in Africa. Their constrained access therefore poses a constraint to the pursuit of more equitable and just modes of political, economic, and social development. Our findings from the study revealed that um, female response was on a broad spectrum, ranging from total silence to outright protest. The general assumption, which is somewhat uh, simplistic and indicative of the masculine expectation of physical resistance is that resistance will be overt and active and follow the legal route. However, this view does not acknowledge the deeply established normative practices and cultures that support violence and silences women. Although our female students' type of resistance differed at this university, 
and did not always take this activist form, which many have come to expect, it was resistance nonetheless. The first form of um, female voice was um, voluntary silence or selective mutism. This type of silence was hinged on um, resigned acceptance that even when they speak up and challenge sexism, nothing was going to change. Female students voluntarily chose to remain silent, even when the consequences of their silence included shame and social ostracism. Silence can reflect disempowerment or can act as an innovative strategy for survival in dangerous spaces. There is an element of choice to the extent to which uh, these female students exercise their, exercise their voice in the struggle for space in higher education. A choice that was driven by the desire to remain in school, even if it hurts, because education represents an investment in their own socioeconomic progress with significant long-term benefits. In other words, female students held the knife with the sharp end. Then there was forced silence. This was a result of the power structures that forcibly mutes women and prohibited them from acknowledging their experiences. <coughs> Excuse me. In this case, uh, this was due to the ambiguous nature of sexist humor, which was prevalent at this institution. Female students had no vocabulary to explain this subtle but equally harmful type of harassment. The available statutes criminalizes overt expressions of harassment where injury is visible. As such, women had to defend and justify why sexist humor was har harassment. And often complaints were subtly dismissed. It can be easy to trivialize uh, sexist humor as harassment, particularly when comparing it to more severe forms of sexual assault. But the harm in sexist humor lies in its everyday and repetitive nature, where communications of women's contributions are trivialized and dismissed. Then there was shame the silence. For some female students, this harassment had, had to be deeply concealed and never be talked about because of the cultural and social ramifications. The stigma and labels that will come with it will ruin their chances at marriage. Uh, female students, we internalize these codes of traditional femininity were less likely to exercise agency as they viewed male aggressiveness as normal. This may signify how solid the, thre the threat of masculine authority is, such that female students would not dare challenge it. Fear of retaliation also from the male, male students reduced women to uh, mute visible objects. And this is something that consumes one's very being. As a result, survivors remained silent for fear of being ostracized and marginalized. However, there were a few brave ones who called out the harasser. Calling out the harasser allowed female students to reclaim their power from the perpetrator. However, those who chose to fight back were aware that shows of resistance may invite further stereotyping from the perpetrator, such as being called crazy, or being dismissed. Uh, a small percentage of the respondents went even further and lodged formal complaints at the university level. Sadly, such reports were met with sympathy or subtle dismissiveness. There were some students who resorted to adopting the superwoman personality. This is when uh, they strive to outpace men in class to prove female intelligence. Excelling over male students in a space which they have claimed is exclusively theirs is a direct challenge. Uh, as Teresa Barnes notes, higher education spaces are intricately linked with codes for men as thinker, aggressive debater, athlete, etc. Therefore, the addition of women to this men's club is thus not only statistical, 
but also an extremely meaningful social and symbolic exercise, which by nature is dynamic, challenging, and likely conflicted. However, it can be argued that being a superwoman student represents how women feel the need to manage their performance for them to be taken seriously or to be viewed as intelligent and to be received uh, as equal partners by male students. Sadly, there were some female students who lent their voices in solidarity with their rasa. They denied the existence of harassment and labeled those who acknowledged harassment as overreacting. This might signify the feminine hope of being admitted uh, into what may be termed respectable uh, heterosexuality by being admitted into the somewhat powerful circles of patriarchy, although this is subject to debate. Identifying and supporting the harasser derails efforts to fight against harassment. As Jane Bennett rightly puts it, is tantamount to taking two steps forward and three steps somewhere else. Then there was another form of silence which was based on protectionism. This was uh, for fear of hurting the Arasa. What if he gets expelled? What if I embarrass him by calling him out? Regardless of these different types of res responses, both outright and restrained, successful or unsuccessful, all have contributed to growth of activism at the university. Gender issues at the university have been granted a respected position with the establishment of a separate center for gender studies named the Mbuyane Under Center. Creation of feminist space in itself is a radical act, more so given that the center derives its inspiration from Mbuyane Under, the first Zimbabwean woman to join the, the liberation struggle. Naming the school after female liberation struggle icon implies acknowledgement of the struggle for gender equity that women are currently engaged in. In conclusion, uh, I'd like to say that the study has shown that the issue of gender activism is far from simple. It is an issue that is both personal and social with far reaching consequences. Therefore, there is need to be aware of messages, both subtle and overt, implicit in the multiple social responses to female violence. Patriarchal domination being the major culprit. Allow me to share with you uh, as my concluding remark, a quote from Ngozi Adichie. She says, we raise girls, we raise girls to cater for the egos of men. We teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We tell girls you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful. Otherwise you threaten the men. We teach girls shame, close your legs, cover yourself. We make, we make them feel as though by being born female, they're already guilty of something. And so girls grow up to be women who cannot see their desire. They grow up to be women who silence themselves. They grow up to be women who cannot say what they truly think. And they grow up, and this is the worst thing we do to girls. They grow up to be women who turn pretense into an art form. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for taking us on that empirical journey. And I think in true anthropological style, you were evocative and um, spoke to the lived experiences of your respondents. So thank you very much for that uh, uh, deep and insightful presentation. We move now to the next speaker, who is a colleague in the School of Social Sciences. She's a researcher, academic, former head of Department of Political Science, but I think my, um, my affinity to her comes from her alter ego, which is, I think, a true personality as activist. And you'll read in her bio that she is a struggle stalwart. And what is fascinating about uh, Dr. Lubna Nadvi is that a lot of her scholarship 
is deeply entangled in her passion and her activism work. And uh, the Lubna that you know is the Lubna that you see, the Lubna that comes through her work. And um, I think that is the power that she brings to the research that she is interested in. Her topic is uh, evaluating reflection, replications of oriental, orientalist forms of knowledge as patriarchy, a focus on the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so she's going to look at knowledge production in the geographical regions of Middle East and North Africa and their politics. Over to you, Lubna. Thank you very much, Prof. Naidu, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and um, um, thank you so much to the organizers of the symposium for giving me this opportunity to share some of my exploratory ideas around uh, my topic. So to start off, I basically um, start reflecting on, uh, in my paper, um, the practice of subjugation of one group of people by another. And I mention a range of um, forms of subjugation um, and, you know, from the advent of slavery uh, across most of Europe, the Middle East, the Orient, Asia, Africa and Americas, um, to the implementation of formal colonialism, apartheid, xenophobia, Afrophobia, Islamophobia, Zionism, anti-Semitism, fascism, patriarchy, neoliberalism, there's so many. Um, and so, Reflecting on these, we can see that our historical records are replete with examples of the most vile and shocking modes of suppression of human beings. Now, while some of these formal, formalized modes of oppression have been legally abolished, they still continue to manifest um, in both subtle and overt forms, be it through policy frameworks, informal practices, knowledge production, uh, state bureaucracies and the like. And many of these forms of subjugation continue to work hand in hand with each other to replicate ongoing subjugation. So it's against this backdrop of oppression and subjugation that this paper really concerns itself with conducting an exploratory analysis. And I you know, um, highlight this because it's all this work is still very exploratory and um, work in progress. Um, so the exploratory analysis of how some components of knowledge production in its various forms, which is uh, through print, digital, or oral forms, is still um, advancing one of the most brutal forms of subjugation in modern times, that of patriarchy. Now, of course, the practice of patriarchy is already deeply embedded in other forms of structural oppression, such as those that I referred to earlier. And what I've chosen to locate the exploration within the context of the framework of Orientalism as an ongoing practice and attempt to interrogate how it is that knowledge production, which can be considered Orientalist in substance and nature, has become a vehicle for the ongoing violence that is being perpetrated by patriarchy. Now, this is not an entirely new claim, and it has been articulated in various ways by feminists such as Fatima Manisi, who in her work, Beyond the Veil, attempted to break down the ethnocentric stereotypes that Western society had developed towards Islam, and especially Muslim women. So in this paper, I'm attempting to take some of those arguments and locate them within the context of a more contemporary 20th century expression of Orientalism, uh, one which is located largely within the Palestinian American academic Edward Said's definition of the top. Now, Edward Said, in his seminal work, Orientalism, refers to three broad definitions of what he means by Orientalism. He argues that, firstly, anyone who teaches, writes about, or researches the Orient, <clears throat> either in its specific or its general aspects, is an Orientalist, and what he or she does is Orientalism. He further posits that even if it does not survive as it once did, Orientalism looks on academically through its doctrines and theses about the Orient and the Oriental. His second uh, explanation is that Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and most of the time the Occident. But for the purposes of this paper, I will use his third definition, which according to him is something 
more historically and materially defined than either of the other two. So taking the late century, late 18th century as a very roughly defined starting point, Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as a corporate institution for dealing with the Orient, dealing with it by making statements about it, authorizing views of it, describing it, by teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In short, Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. Now, Orientalism as a field of study has arguably evolved over the years. Prior to Said's conceptualizing of the term as the corporate institution for dealing with the Orient, it had been a term used largely to refer to the literature, art, culture, and other aspects of the geographical region of the Orient, more commonly known today as the Middle East and parts of Asia. And now Said's definition, however, arguably brought into sharp focus the oppressive and indeed colonialist elements of the practice of placing an Orientalist lens on how the region of the Orient was perceived and understood. Um, other scholars agreed with him. For example, in Empire, a very short introduction, Stephen Howe agrees with Said that Western nations and their empires were created by the exploitation of underdeveloped countries and the extraction of wealth and labor from one country to another. So one can extrapolate from these um, scholars who have agreed with Said a very clear link between the practice of Orientalism and Western forms of colonialism and imperialism. Well-known African intellectual Mahmoud Mamdani, in his work, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, argues that Said very effectively summed up the principal dogmas of Orientalism. And there are quite a few, but because of time, I'll just go through a few. The one being, which portrays the West as rational, developed, humane, superior, yet caricatures the Orient as aberrant, undeveloped, and inferior. Another dogma is that the Orient is at the bottom something either to be feared or to be controlled by pacification, research, and development, an outright occupation wherever possible. Now, in the introduction, I attempted to draw the link between ongoing Orientalist practices as being akin to Western colonialism and imperialism. And this notion has been widely accepted and confirmed by many scholars other than Said. So now I want to uh, talk about how a, sub a sub substantive amount of knowledge production that has been generated within a more contemporary context, that is the 20th and 21st century, about the geographical region of the Middle East and Asia, and even their diasporic communities, how it is that this uh, knowledge production has a very clear patriarchal agenda and bias. And I will do this by examining a few examples of what some scholars would describe and categorize as Orientalist scholarship by one prominent author. And because of time constraints, I can't look at more than that. Now, at this point, it's useful to articulate a working definition of patriarchy within which one can locate the core argument of this paper. Given that patriarchy as an ideological framework and a set of practices is defined differently across various academic disciplines and social contexts, it's important to capture definition that will be adequate for the purposes of this paper. Some definitions argue that patriarchy is largely a philosophical idea that others women, where a woman is considered a second class citizen, some regard it as a social structure that oppresses and subjugates women, even if they have civil and political rights. Others view patriarchy as a social system in which men dominate in a variety of roles and are beneficiaries of social privileges accorded to them by that system. And then there's a view that patriarchy as a social system is harmful, oppressive, and subjugates women and men and society at large. So it is this last all-encompassing idea of patriarchy that I wish to utilize to locate my arguments. Now to quickly return to Said's first definition of Orientalism, which basically refers to anyone who teaches, writes about, or researches the Orient. It is a harmless enough definition and no different to calling someone who teaches, writes about, or researches politics a political scientist. 
However, for those of us in the academy who understand how knowledge and research can very often become a vehicle for propaganda and ideological domination and subjugation, it is important to distinguish between um, simply writing about a subject area and being able to discern whether the writing is intended to advance ulterior motives or not, which is why Said's third definition of Orientalism is so important and liberating, as it truly speaks truth to power by enabling one to subject various modes of knowledge about the Orient or to use the contemporary terms of the Middle East and Asia to a more refined analysis. <clears throat> now, the body of information, knowledge, and material can be available on the contemporary Middle East and Asia, and of course their diaspora communities is huge, massive. In the wake of September 11, 2001 in particular, scholars from across the world and with the knowledge production fraternity at large produced a huge amount of material in the form of printed text, online content, forms, audiovisual and digital items for broader consumption. Much of this material attempted to counter the rising Islam of Islamophobia and hatred of the Middle East and persons of Middle Eastern and Asian origin. However, there were some who arguably considered this an ideal opportunity to advance certain ideological values that presented propaganda, falsehoods, and myths about the Middle East and Asia as facts to be consumed and acted upon. Now, one of these scholars identified as falling into this category is Bernard Lewis, who, while well known for his historical work on the Middle East, amongst many others, is often cited by some contemporary scholars as someone who wrote and in a very biased manner towards the Middle East region. Sayyid's own critique of Lewis's work is very instructive, and he argues, for example, that Lewis treats Islam in a monolithic entity without the nuance of its plurality, internal dynamics, and historical complexities, and accuses him of demagoguing and downright ignorance. Furthermore, Sayyid also criticized Lewis as simply not being able to deal with the diversity of Muslim, much less human life, because it is close to him as something foreign, radically different and other. And he criticized Lewis's inability to grant that the Islamic peoples and Arab peoples are entitled to their own cultural, political and historical practices, free from Lewis's calculated attempt to show that because they are not Western, they can't be good. Now, a substantial consequence of the scholarship produced by Lewis, such as what went wrong, the clash between Islam and modernity in the Middle East, the crisis of Islam, holy war and unholy terror, and the Arabs in history and others, in the immediate aftermath of the September 11 attacks was the use of his works to guide and inspire, for example, the policy frameworks of the neoconservative government of George W. Bush which ultimately ended up invading Afghanistan and Iraq and started a more than decades long global war against terrorism that had severe implications for the Middle East, Asia, and the rest of the world. It became a well-known fact that Lewis was frequently consulted by the Bush administration in order to guide their foreign policy objectives in the Middle East. Now, in terms of linking this to patriarchy, uh, patriarchy it's important to understand that the masculine power dynamics that are inevitably conjured up in these machinations through the use of oriental uh, literature or oriental writing can only lead to one conclusion, which is that deep-rooted patriarchy drives both the production of the knowledge as well as the politics that it services. And so in concluding, I want to affirm that there's a huge link between the orientalist nature of the writing of uh, scholars like uh, Bernard Lewis, and of course, the fact that they ultimately uh, serve a very patriarchal agenda. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nadvi. Thanks, Lubna, for that uh, really insightful paper that uh, troubles this notion of orientalism and uh, peels back these shifting shifting spaces that this word ideology occupies. 
and its ramifications through policy frameworks, because as we know, policy documents are far from neutral. We hope to come back to you in the Q&A section. Uh, we move now to the next speaker, who's Professor Vivian uh, Jong. And uh, please don't be uh, fooled by the fact that we are different heights and maybe even different hues. She is my sister from another mother. And um, she is the acting Dean of School of Social Sciences and in many ways, the um, driving force for this particular symposium from the UK's ZN side. Uh, Professor Jong uh, researches and publishes across a, a diverse intellectual terrain as you would gather from reading her uh, bio and she has done this um, I think even before we discovered the word interdisciplinarity so she is um, extensively published research has graduated a large cohort of students and I, I could go on as I could go on for many of the other speakers but I will guide you back to the uh, brochure she's going to be taking us to another space a contested and uh, highly volatile violent space which is in the guise of the church and talking to us about decolonizing the church. And even if that is possible, uh, her title of her presentation is Decolonizing the Church, what should constitute the agenda for an African Christian feminist and feminism, I suppose. She's gonna look at popular uh, and academic discourses and debates about religion in Africa and, and talk to us about a vibrant spiritual capitalism. Thank you, uh, Vivian, over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Naidu. Um, greetings, uh, panelists, and um, greetings to all the, the participants. Um, I'm so delighted to share with you some of my, my experiences. My paper, this particular uh, presentation is around um, my, my position mainly because um, most of you who know me, they know me as a pastor and at the same time I'm an academic. And I often find it, you know, I find it weird when people meet me and it's they, you know, they're trying to box me in. And so being trained as an anthropologist, I, I had those, that epistemic struggle. And so I, I'll just like, for the interest of time, I just want to just um, quickly speak to a couple of issues. I've got just 10 minutes. And I'll leave the rest to to the to the quiz to the Q and A session. So um for this particular um uh, paper, I'll just like to demonstrate what constitutes um the the agenda for for Christian African Christian feminists, and also to explore my position my positionality, which has been like my journey uh, throughout from when I began as a young academic up to where I am now, and I'm think um, going forward my positionality as an academic and a religious practitioner. I'm actually a leader of one of the Pentecostal churches in South Africa. And the tension that exists within me as I engage in knowledge production. Um, I'll also try to establish whether decolonization is taking place in the churches and how it is done and the impact it has on women and to demonstrate the extent to which the church being actually a tool of colonialism through but two biblical principles continue to promote the oppression of African women. And finally, to reveal some of the inroads made by African Christian families to the decolonial uh, project. Like I said, um, I am I'm an anthropologist and a Pentecostal pastor, and I often find myself trying to practice and engage anthropology uh, and to preach a gospel that is relevant in its context. My intellectual mind and my strong desire to be epistemologically free. See, that, that, that has been, that has driven and has actually given, taken, uh, given shape to my scholarship and teaching um, from when I, I, I entered the academy. To be epistemologically free. And as far back, I remember more than a decade ago, I, I together with my, my postdoctoral fellow, uh, uh, fellow at the time, Dr. General Butuki, we published a paper, I think it was in 2010, and the title of that paper was um, Emancipation or Reconstituted a Subordination, where we looked at uh, the position of professional women, where we find a woman who is, who is empowered uh, through education because uh, we know from, 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 from statistics that uh, education is an empowerment tool. 
And so we began asking, teasing, asking questions. How is it that the African women, despite all the education, despite the level of empowerment, as she happens to find herself in a very subjugated and oppressed position. So that moved me on to, I think later on, I think it was in 2011 or 12, around that time, I can't remember clearly. I did a, I did a research and I published a paper which was which I looked at the rights of the rights rights versus human rights versus empowerment of women vis-a-vis -vis the requirement, the Christian requirement of every wife to submit to the authority of the husband. And I'll say that to you, say this to you. Um, my personal experience, you see, I, I speak to you from the from, from my experience. Um, at that time, um, the partner in my life, you know, I I was in a very challenging space. I remember going, I remember wanting to buy a, a, a certain um, a, a, a technological tool. And I said to him, um, I want us to buy this. And he said, no, we don't have money for that. And I said, no, I'm not asking you to bring the money. I will buy it. I, 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 do, earn a, I do earn an income. And he said to me, if you buy it, keep it in your office. Don't bring it here. So you see, uh, for me, I've looked for that. I've tried to understand myself and also trying to understand uh, the position of other women. Also, because you will get to know as I continue my presentation that the church is that space where you find a majority of women, women um, who seem to fall under some kind of oppression in the experience inequality, the, the, the experience, the violence, gender-based violence, and so on. So for me, that, that, that whole desire to be epistemologically free um, and also being a feminist um, anthropologist with an inclination to reject anything Western and to promote an African uh, led scholarship and to generate knowledge that has utility within our social context. It, it, it became, it, those, those tensions, they were always around me. Um, and, and then, and then uh, as a pastor, I felt that I, I, I was obligated to preach a gospel from the text, which is the Bible, and we understand the nature of text. Texts which are just sensitive barometers with embedded meaning. And is if you if you understand how religion is structured and practiced, it's, it's dogmatic. There is no room for engage, there's no room for critical engagement. You can't critique. You can critique it in church, you can critique it in the academic space. But here am I, I am an academic who is supposed to, to critique, and I'm critiquing in the academic space. But at the same time, when I find myself at the poop or the pulpit trying to preach, I cannot do that. And so it got to a point where I almost resigned from work. I almost resigned from the university just to focus and do church because the tensions were too much. But then I got to a point where I felt that no, I think I've got, I have to, I, I, I felt that I, I was a cultural insider and um, I, I, I occupied that, that, that space, that ideological space where I could, I, I could self-conscientize to empower uh, other women. So those tensions, they, they continued with me and, and, and I, I, I eventually, um, around uh, 20, 2019, I, I, I carried out a study. Let me just share, I just want to, so that you understand where I'm coming from, I want to share a, I, I'm not going to share the entire, I'm not going to read from there. Um, I'll draw your attention just to specific, uh, Um, okay, so what, what happens is that with, 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 with the project, the decolonization project, uh, and I found it very interesting. It was easier for me to engage with other aspects of scholarship, but to decolonize the church, it became very tricky. How do you decolonize? Because decolonization suggests a doing away, a, a doing away with it, doing away with everything that is Western, because and, and, and you understand that the church is a product of colonial of colonialism, and also at the same time, that church um, with all its patriarchal uh, its patriarchal practices has ensured that colonialism endures. So to decolonize the church will mean unlearning Christianity or doing away with. How do you do that? It because for decolonization to happen, there has to be an alternative. Now, do we have an alternative? We don't. 
But if we, if we, if I have to copy, if I were to copy from um, from Fanon, from Fanon who who actually looks at it as a way of reimagining, that we reimagine uh, the, the the position of we reimagine what is not just doing away, but reimagine and 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 and, and create it. Then we cannot begin to engage with a decolonization of the church. But to and 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 and, and decolonizing the church will mean for me, I I I tried I targeted leadership, leadership of the churches. So you see, um, I, I looked at a study which was done in um, a study which was done in 2010. Here is the the, the the picture that you see here, which shows sorry, which shows um a background, a background of, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. It shows the background and the, 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 the population of, um, of churches. You find that a majority of the churches is constituted by women. It's made by women. And then you begin to ask yourself the question, is a majority and men and women look at the gender gap in religion around the world. Men and women attending churches. You find that a majority of the churches is, 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 is populated by women. And if you, we understand how churches are, uh, most of the churches are democratic in, 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 in principle, um, where elections take place, how is it that um, men end up as the leaders and women being the majority cannot, uh, cannot uh, put a woman in leadership? So in 2019, I carried out this study. This study here in 20, 2019, and I did a sample of um, where I looked at church leadership because I found that to decolonize the church, you can only do that, you can successfully do that by interrogating the issue of church leadership. If you do not, if you do not, if you do not critique that space, it will be difficult to decolonize the church because um, majority of the of African women define themselves in church. African BT had told us Africans are notoriously religious. And then you find the women, women mostly, you find them in church submitting under leadership. So that if you look at the study that I did in, in 2019 of the 100 churches that I, I, I surveyed in, in, in Southern Africa, 92% of the churches are led by men and are founded by men. Only 5%, you see, 5% are, are constitute uh, female leadership. That is churches that are uh, found by women and 3% are jointly led by, by men and women. So then the problem is, how do, you, how do we decolonize a church if we do not interrogate the issue of church leadership? And I tell you why, if a woman has, you know, churches, the churches, as we get to know it as religion, they structure and they guide people's behavior. Now, uh, and they sanction those behaviors as well. If a woman uh, goes to, to, to a pastor who is mo most likely to be a man, because we can see from the statistics, 92%. If a woman goes to church and complains about the issue of gender-based violence, abuse, whether psychological, emotional, um, and other forms that it may take, they are most likely to go to the man, to meet a man. A man who will now look back in, straight into the text and tell the woman, no, you see, the Bible says for, to be a good wife, all wives must submit themselves under the authority of the man. And that, you know, you should be nice, treat your husband nicely and so on. So um, I, I just want to take that up. In the interest of time and colleagues, I just, I just um, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I engage with this, I feel strongly, I have the paper and will be circulating a, a, a soon. I feel that there are some things that have happened around that. I'm just, as I conclude, and there's a few examples around of that, from that 5%. Some, we have some good stories. For instance, we have an example of, um, uh, sorry, did I, I, I was not supposed to take that slide down. I'll show you here. We have an example of, um, an example of, um, If you look at this, an example of women who have broken through that glass ceiling of leadership, 
We had the appointment of the first female presiding bishop in the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church in South Africa, you see, for the first time, she became the first 100 amongst 100. So we had 99 men leading, and she is the first presiding bishop elected. Uh, uh, to be the presiding bishop in the Methodist Church in South Africa. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, there are little, we have, like some of us, I constitute part of that 5%. And, and there's much more that we can do. And so for me, the way forward, uh, the way forward would be um, to, to look at how, how we can re-methodologize and, and see how to, how to use our own examples and embark on emancipation, learning, resocialization, and, and, and ensure that we, we, we actually engage, we, we, we critique the issue of church leadership in Africa. So um, I'll leave it at that, and I think I will take your questions. For me, decolonizing the church will not, it's not about unlearning, doing away with Christianity. But speaking from Fanon, what we can do is to reimagine ourselves and use our context uh, in a way that we set, we focus on the experiences of women and see what can be done to empower them, to promote and, and eradicate uh, the issue of gender uh, inequality. So I, I, I leave you with this quote as I end. I just leave you with that quote. Uh, thank you so much, um, colleague. The woman leads, um, you can read it and thank you. I know that I have I've gone above my 10 minutes. But thank you so much, uh, Professor Naidu. Thanks so much, Vivian. If you could stop uh, sharing screen. Uh, thank you for that. I think there were lots of delicious, provocative uh, morsels that we can pick on, not least of which uh, your notion of uh, epistemologically free. Um, uh, so that's something uh, hopefully we have some time to come back to. Thank you for taking us into the space of the church and the way you've defined church in terms of the scaffold of leadership. Uh, it would be interesting to, to interrogate whether just placing a female leader actually changes anything or whether that's another kind of incarnation of patriarchy. And that question has kind of surfaced from the uh, 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 audience itself. We want to move now quickly to the next speaker who's Dr. Shamla Rama. She's also a colleague in the School of Social Sciences. Recently, she's taken on the mantle of leadership in her cluster and is leading several departments under her. Um, she has been very prolific recently. And if you read her bio, she has published um, chapters and has worked extensively in her discipline of sociology. Um, I don't want to take up too much of time. Uh, her topic is um, gen reflecting on ge the gender curriculum content looking at decolonization, Africanization, and transformation in South Africa. So we're looking forward to listening to you, uh, Shamla. Over to you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present on this very uh, illustrious panel and to engage with the idea of uh, decolonization, Africanization, and what does it mean in terms of the context uh, in teaching in sociology, which is my uh, discipline. And I focus particularly on the classroom and looking at first year sociology, which I used to teach, but it actually relates also to the undergraduate program because the undergraduate program is what then launches the postgraduate, the research. So what kind of student do we produce at that level and how do we engage with them? There were also some very interesting points that Professor Nyamjo made, which I will touch on as I think it really blends into the kinds of things we're looking at. So globally, the curriculum content of the undergraduate sociology modules are typically predetermined by the text or the textbooks that we select for that particular class. Most of our textbooks, particularly if you're teaching in Africa and in South Africa, are developed and published in the global north, particularly in the USA. So that will tell you about the examples, the hegemonic bias, the philosophical bias, the methodological bias that exists. But textbooks are the key pedagogical tools that we use. 
And I talk about a bit about this new wave that we're seeing in terms of the decolonial Africanization, indigenization, where there is this idea to then revise international textbooks. For me, this is a very contested and restricted space because you are restricted to maintaining the structure and the content of this international global north textbook. And in some cases, the manner in which the publishers engage with you about how to transform it to meet to a South African and African audience is problematic because the suggestion is, well, just substitute some of our examples for African or South African examples. That does not speak to the issues of the hegemony and the biases. So what we then end up doing is, and if we want to locate this into some of the decolonial literature, Gramsci talks about encyclopedic knowledge. That's what we then start to produce when we're teaching sociology to our students. We don't become cognizant of what am I teaching? How does this make sense to the student? All I'm thinking about is I have to get through this content, I've got a next class to do, and the pressures that are existing on us. Paulo Freer talks about the idea that we expound on a topic completely alien to the existential experience of the students. Sociology is extremely theoretical, abstract, and we lose students after the second year. So we have a high number of first years and second years by the third and postgraduate, we have really frightened them away. They look at this theory and think, how am I to deal with this monster? And in the push, especially from the fees must fall and roads must fall context about how do we transform our teaching, our pedagogical practices, our curriculum and our content. Do we throw everything out, which is sometimes the more popular rhetor uh, rhetorical or populist view in the South African society? But Ken Assange tells us Afrocentricity is not a black version of Eurocentricity. Because if we follow that line, we then are reproducing and perpetuating the discrimination and biases of minority groups of vulnerable and at-risk populations, because we want to then replace one dominant view with another dominant view. So it brings in the tropes of power, dominance, and struggles by just replacing the one with the other. But it also challenges us. If we are to look at what Prof talked about in the first speech, a convivial scholarship, how do we engage with that? How do we readjust our thinking, challenge our own expressions in the classroom? Paulo Freer also talks about the poor lived in a culture of silence dominated by the ideas and the values of others. And that is important when you look at who is it that is sitting in my classroom? Who is it that I am speaking to? Who is it that I am sharing this knowledge with? And how do I locate myself? Am I positioning myself as the knower and they as somebody who doesn't know? Or do I recognize in them their lived experiences? So the sociology texts that we have do not adequately reflect the lived experiences or to draw from sea right mode, the private troubles and public issues of the young people who are our audience in the teaching. In particular, in my context, female, black and African students living in South Africa and Africa. And who are these students? At UKZN, between 80 to 85, 85 to 90% of our students come from Quintal 1 and 2 schools. These are no pay, fee paying schools, meaning that these young people live already in resource poor settings, experiencing economic deprivation, forms of marginalization and exclusion, although demographically, African population in South Africa is the majority, but their experiences are that that we need to engage with. In my classroom, most of the students are female. 
So again, the textbook does not reflect who it is that I'm teaching to. So does what I teach and how I teach resonate with the students and engage them with analyzing the social problems, change and phenomena they have to discuss? Our concern then is the exercise that I gave them, the students, around how do they engage with C. Wright Mills's work. And in particular, the students then wrote an essay where they had to reflect on their personal experiences. And in looking at the essay, I didn't anticipate the kinds of responses that student gave, gave us. They reflected their lived realities in ways that we didn't, I didn't anticipate. So for example, students, I didn't ask them to write about this, but they wrote very deeply personal stories that told me that they, this is their lived experience. For example, one says, my personal problem is abuse. I am physically and emotionally abused by my boyfriend. He forces me to have sex with him without using a condom. This is from a first year student who's probably 18, 19 years old. Although I didn't ask for these kinds of stories, but they chose to talk these very personal stories. And when I look at Paolo Fria's work, how do I contextualize the fact that students have decided to really share with me very deeply and personal stories for an essay assignment? Paolo Fria talks about generative themes, things that are really important to people wanting to change. And in looking at the essay that I had set students, I then started to wonder, well, how do I understand this particular responses from the students? Do I then just not talk about this? Do I change the, the essay? But Hooks, Bell Hooks's work says that the narrative of our experiences in the classroom discussions eliminates the ways and possibilities we can function as knowing. And Professor Nyamjo talked about including the voices of students. The, the professor does not always have the insight in the classroom and, how, and about monopolizing that insight, but rather how through our shared experiences, we can gauge, engage with this. Hooks also talks about stories as being healing. So when I looked at this particular essay assessment that I had set for the students and asked them to look at concepts and their own experiences and engage with that, by bringing in their stories, perhaps it was a way for them to heal, to engage with me and emotional and bringing in uh, stories also requires emotional intelligence to telling the story that heightens our awareness and perception of who our students are, what are we teaching them? And sometimes when we use the examples in our teaching, we do them with such lack of passion. And yet these are the lived realities of our students. So rather than reflecting on some of the examples, in my class experience, I try to engage with the students. So many of our students then are living these realities that we are theorizing about, intersectionality, patriarchy, power relations, unequal, exclusion and violence in our society. And for me, the classroom then becomes a space where I bring in the theory and we then engage with our own experiences. So it's not just about decolonizing and Africanizing. Before we can even get to that, we have to start humanizing our pedagogy. This for me is not a complete process. Each time I've got to rework and rethink. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Sorry if I went over my time. Thank you so much, uh, Shamla. Thank you for that. I think you ended on the perfect, powerful note that loops us back to Ashil's talk on uh, talking about humanizing whatever it is that we're doing. And you're talking about humanizing in the space of uh, higher education and space between the lines of our textbooks. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. We move now to the last speaker, who is um, Dr. Um, Amina Yakin. She's a reader in Urdu and post-colonial studies at SOAS. She's extensively published, as you would see from her bio. Um, most importantly, she's chair of the Decolonizing Working Group, director of the SOAS Festival of Ideas, 
Chair of the Center for the Study of Pakistan and Program, co-convener for the BA English Program. Um, thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Amina. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Naidu. And um, greetings to all my fellow panelists and to all the people who are uh, here. It's always been um, a, a dream to connect with colleagues in South Africa. So this is, I wish we could have done it in person, but this is the next best thing. Um, I've learned so much from this, from this panel and I already um, <laughs> have the pressure of being the last speaker and trying to do this in 10 minutes. So I'm going to make some huge moves in my paper. So please forgive me. It comes out of a piece that I wrote um, on um, Islamic feminism in a time of Islamophobia that is about um, a close reading of uh, Leila Abu Leila's Minaret and um, Elif Shafak's 40 Rules of Love. I'm not going to go through through those close readings, but what I'm going to do is map some ideas and thoughts in relation to to feminist, to this kind of con context of Islamic feminism in a time of Islamophobia and where my work is going. So the question of feminism has been central to my work for the last 20 years, and I have engaged with a variety of political philosophies and worked across languages and cultures to th think through the concept of agency and how it has been understood by feminist scholars from Gertrude Spivak to Amina Vadud. As a post-colonialist, I am committed to the question of social justice and the question of rights, and interested in how the woman question connects to global protest movements from India to South Africa and its disconnect with women's everyday lives. Working across cultures from Africa to Asia and civilizational narratives has impressed upon me the need for a methodology that takes into consideration a variety of moral and ethical contexts to formulate a dialogic feminist model that is informed by ideas of coexistence and mutual trust and the question of agency. What kind of world might we find this model in? There was much discussion about planetarity in yesterday's keynote conversation with Ashil, and I would argue that planetarity requires from us a model of being good that has so far eluded us in democratic and liberal societies. So I see the life futures of feminism in coexistence with post-colonial studies and decolonial thought as an activist and transformative project that disrupts normative political cultures. Let me talk about this a bit more in relation to my work and how it has come to take shape in my study of Muslim representation. Um, and I'm just going to sort of very briefly touch on this uh, in relation to media coverage and the co-authored book Framing Muslims. Uh, media coverage of Muslim issues in the 20th century, as Ad Edward Said noted, was dominated by major disputes such as the Iran hostage crisis of 1979, Anthony Thomas's controversial 1980 docudrama Death of a Princess, and the Rushdie Affair of 1989. In the 21st century, we continue to see issue-led stories focusing on a narrow and repeated series of supposed Muslim misdemeanors. When it comes to such coverage, the kind of global and transnational loyalties represented by the Muslim Ummah come to form the emotive power driving suspicion of multiculturalism at home and neo-colonial adventures abroad. Now, the long, long durée of framing means that the task of politicians in bringing the press on board at least partially for their projects is already half done for them so boris johnson can make islamophobic comments about muslim women as letterboxes and not be accountable for it because that is already normalized in the media sphere more recently we see this in the interview on women's hour bbc radio 4 with zara mohammed the the first female representative of the Muslim Council of Britain and the interview with Emma Barnett and how it's been um, protested against as a hostile interview. Um, and, and, you know, today I was reading there's a response in the Jewish Chronicle to, to this sort of um, and, and a, you know, discussion enfolding about the Muslim Council of Britain, which by no means is, is an easy um, uh, space in, in terms of its representation of a community that is diverse. But, but you know, it, it's already kind of spiraling into lots of different directions from Islamophobia to anti-Semitism. So 
and and we really don't have the time to talk about technoscapes here a la upper the rye but that's something i'd be happy to pick up in the q a if we have time so, so the thing i want to pick up is the image of veiled muslim women as an oppressed minority that is a well-loved sta staple of the right-wing press and a contemporary manifestation of old orientalist images in respect to islam and christ to save the muslim woman and this is not to deny that Islamic regimes in the Middle East, Africa, South Asia have often forced women into more circumscribed roles and punished deviation from accepted societal norms with violence and death. Instead, it is to redirect our attention towards the imagery used in such calls and the cultural assumptions of safe superiority, often deep rooted and tenacious, they draw on. Uh, in Framing Muslims, we uh, looked at, I looked uh, at the example of Muslim lifestyle dolls as the affirmation of a visual stereotype. And I, and this is my, um, this is my kind of prop, as it were, the lifestyle doll. Um, as the need, as the affirmation of a visual stereotype, emphasizing the need for recognition of faith-based identities in secular nations, we explored the tension between a more conventional globalized cosmopolitan marketing phenomenon and its modern Islamic equivalent in the branding of lifestyle dolls for young children across the world, as well as the performativity of identities through role play and mimicry. What we were interested to point out in our analysis, borrowing from Bakhtin and Paba, was the inherent dialogicality in the way such constructions are formed and the two proffered identities that are mutually shaping. Um, and um, from framing Muslims to contested, uh, contesting Islamophobia is then a journey through arts and culture, ranging from youth activism, new media, superheroes, visual art, and the common strand that is a part of this is the veil. And as I've argued, traditionally ethnographies and orientalist narratives have played a major part in translating the veil in Muslim women for the West. And recently, creative writing by Muslim women in particular captures the attention for its seemingly authentic confessional style. So it's a kind of anthropological, you know, in, insight into lifting the veil on women's subjugation. And from the polemical feminist position of a well-known Egyptian writer such as Nawal al sadavi to the psychological feminine writing of the British Sudanese writer Leila Abu Leila, we can see varied interpretations grappling with specific historic moments in Muslim women's identification with pious forms of dress. Now what I'm going to, I have very, very little time, so I'm really going to jump. Uh, and what I do is look, engage with um, how the naturalized uh, view of women's oppression is looked at by looking at the specificity of historical and regional contexts in Islamic societies and an alternative way of reading the whale. And you'll be, some of you will be familiar with the work of Sabah Mahmoud and the Politics of Piety, which is an ethnographic study of the mosque movement, which is a woman's revivalist Islamic grassroots Dava piety movement and provides an insight into the debate that has taken place amongst its members over how female modesty should be lived and the necessity of wearing the veil to prove one's virtue. So very much kind of about how you own shame. Emphasizing the point about the performativity of the veil as a marker of piety and the inner transformation of the soul, she offers a reading that explains how within the movement, Sharia is absorbed as a moral and ethical duty. Now, this is also something uh, that Islamic feminists pick up on in a different way by engaging with Quranic concepts of khilafah, trusteeship and tawheed, oneness of God. And one of the surahs in the Quran that is very troubling is Surah Al-Nisa, which is about wom women and is often read as providing proof of the elevation of men over women. And this is the one that Islamic feminists have kind of reinterpreted and re-engaged and looked at the Quranic term Kavamuna Allah from the surah, which has been interpreted in a variety of ways to support uh, established gender hierarchies, and this has caused disagreement. So the feminist rendition by Amna Wadud suggests uh, that it's a meaning of complementarity rather than separate gender differences or identities in, of two genders. And so it allows a correlation instead of hierarchy. 
So in a global environment in which the burqa and female veiling continue to be framed as one of the main sources of intercultural controversy today, when you get a novel such as The 40 Rules of Love by Elif Shafak, the Turkish um, writer, global writer, appears to offer an alternative with its representation of the heterodox tradition of a softer Sufi Islam and the popularity of this brand of Islam among liberal audiences is evident from the novel's best-selling status. At the other end of the spectrum, the psychologically dense story of Minaret reinforces a conservative view of Islam that carries a certain appeal, both to a niche Muslim readership who want to see an account of the spiritual life in print, and for totally different reasons to a hostile Islamophobic readership looking for more examples of women's oppression in Islam. So the clash of perspectives between Abu Layla and Shafak is to be found in the respective fates of their representative heroines delivered through the popular genres of romance and historical fiction for a global English readership. While they both contest Islamophobia as they map efforts towards female agency through Islamic models, they also reiterate certain myths about Islam from heterodox mysticism to pious renewal through the veil. So in conclusion, and, and again, you know, I'm making some jumps here. Um, in conclusion, what I want to say is women's mobilities underline how transnational women's performativity and labor contribute to transformative and critical narratives about the veil. And they don't ask for a reiteration of the he Hegelian dialectic or the, and, and they demand something beyond empathy and ethical and emotional thinking of the body and the self, disrupting normative Western um, understandings of the secular and the sacred. So perhaps hinting a little bit towards the po polyvocality that was referenced at the start by Professor Naidu. I I'll just end there. And, and I'm sorry, there have been a lot of jumps in here, but I'm just very conscious of time. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I want to say catch your breath because it's, <laughs> I, I appreciate how much you, you compressed into there, those few minutes. And uh, we, we have, we would have had two minutes, but we've been donated uh, 10 more minutes. So we have about 12 minutes for questions. But rather than me reading what most of you would have read already, I want to just formally thank uh, Amina for her presentation, allow her to catch her breath and scan through to see their questions that may come up for her. So I want to invite uh, you to just look through the questions rather than me reading it and, and let me know if there's anything that you would like to answer, even if you've typed in an answer. But I want to go to one question, which even though it's been uh, answered, um, I, I want to invite uh, Vivian to, to take this question because it's from a student and uh, we preface this entire symposium by saying that it wasn't just, you know, academics speaking to academics but that we wanted to hear and speak to students. Uh, Vivian, uh, you have read the question, but just to, to draw your attention again, while the rest of you look through other questions that you might want to, to address live. Uh, the question regarding African spirituality, which uh, was not mentioned, and uh, the claim that, uh, I, I like provocative questions. So uh, the questioner is asking, um, you know, why have you not considered African spirituality in your arguments? Uh, are we thinking that it's just a vacuum, that there was no God uh, for, the, for African people and um, the consideration that th this might be highly misleading. So if you could respond, but a little sort of succinctly so that we could maybe take a few more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I would just like the, the, the participants to those who post questions to actually go to um, to the Q&A uh, session and, and read some of the responses because I may not have the time to answer all. And if you have further questions, you can take my email address and write to me. Because of the time, I could not actually explain everything. I could not even really explain the entire paper in 10 minutes. But African Africans are very spiritual and very religious. That is well established. But the, this particular presentation, it's about the church because spirituality is very broad. Africans have an understanding, generally speaking, Africans have an understanding of, of God, which is uh, they, they, in all the different languages, they have, they understand that there is a supreme being. They are spiritual in that way, but how they approach the supreme being is what makes it different from the colonial, from the kind of a religion that was uh, introduced through colonialism, which we practice through the churches. So I'll have to just try and explain this in the context of the church. I cannot 
Africans are spiritual, and but we are looking at decoloniality in the context of the church because we all understand that the church has been the church is a very enduring uh, enduring uh, uh, colonial tool, which is the uh, although although as academics we are engaging in other aspects of colonial colonial of uh, colonialism and how to decolonize um, decolonize certain aspects of our everyday experiences in contemporary Africa. We have still not able, we have not been able to decolonize that space, that church. So spirituality, um, I don't know who raised the question, but spiritual, Africans are spiritual, but to, to understand the context, we have to look at, we have to look at the churches. The spirituality within the churches, church as we know it today, is the is a colonial project. So I want you to understand the presentation in the line in line in light of the church. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Naidu. Thank you, Vivian. There was a question earlier. There are quite a few, so I'm just being uh, picky and uh, picking on the, a few here. Uh, to Rose uh, regarding uh, Afro matriarchy. Uh, Rose, do you want to quickly comment uh, on that uh, and your experience in the context of your empirical study? Yes, thank you, Professor Naidu. Uh, unfortunately, there are still some women who deny that harassment exists. Remember, women are not a homogeneous group, so we can't force them or pull them to share the same view as we share, but we only hope that they will share uh, the same view and share the struggle with other women. Our only request for now is for those who have been um, uh, who have queries with this or who face this type of harassment to seek legal recourse. Because remember, um, the uh, policies that exist at different institutions do not only cater for one type of gender, they cater for the males as well as the females. So those who are, we have queries have to seek legal recourse. We can't really expect women to share one worldview, unfortunately. Thank you. Thanks for that, Rose. Uh, Shamla, Lubna, Amina, uh, scanning through, is there any question that you would like to uh, answer live, uh, Shamla and Lubna? I'll take Lubna first since she, uh, in the order that they presented. Is there anything that you'd like to, if not, maybe a, a minute to, to round up your thoughts, anything that you want to add in the context of um, the other speakers' presentations and the questions raised? Thank you, Prof. Naidu. There weren't any specific questions uh, addressed to me, but I just want to maybe reflect on some of the things that uh, the other panelists have said, which link to perhaps some of the thoughts that I raised, that, you know, decolonization um, is, is a long-term project and how we decolonize various spaces, be it uh, a gendered curriculum or a, a the church space. Uh, or, you know, ideas around uh, Islamic uh, feminism and so on. And in fact, what I was talking about relating to um, Orientalist modes of knowledge production. I mean, these are all uh, long-term processes and we have to find different methodologies that will enable us to actually achieve the best version of the knowledge that we want. And to use the term humanism uh, that Dr. Rama also used, that when we need to humanize um, you know, our spaces uh, and, and decolonizing has to be uh, bringing us back to being human. Uh, and in the African context, you know, re, uh, revisiting Ubuntu. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Nadvi. Dr. Rama, a, a last a minute for uh, any sort of final words that you want to share? Thank you very much. Uh, I think some of the uh, uh, Participants asked for my email address, so I have put that up. I more than welcome any engagement around this. And just to say that uh, in terms of sociology, for the first time this week, we're having the International uh, Sociological Association um, Forum. And for the first time, we inaugurated the a sesh, a, a, a thematic group, which will then move on to become a research group called teaching sociology. So when Professor Nyamjo was talking about, you know, the global south, global north debate, 
for us, this was exciting because it was sociologists from the global north and global south. We're hoping for a lot more people to participate because this was just our inaugural session. But for the first time, we're actually engaging with what we're teaching. How do we humanize this uh, process? Because it does not only impact on what we're teaching, it's also the research. And then how do people then take that into their communities? We've had experiences of some uh, Global North uh, colleagues talking about, you know, they went to conferences on decolonization and were told to remove all the white people from their slides and possible new textbooks that they're going to be looking at. So, you know, these kinds of very distorted understandings of what decolonization means and almost you know, negating people from history when, like uh, Pros uh, Niyamjo said, it's about engaging, regardless of whether you're doing your research and recognizing the humanity in the others and in yourself. Thank you. And I'm more than happy to respond to email queries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rama. Um, Amina, um... Dr. Yakin, maybe the last uh, word to you. Uh, I don't know if you've spotted any questions, but I was fascinated by this persistent uh, epistemic violence on the uh, discourses around the veil, even when there's so much about the um, sort of emancipatory power uh, where women choose to wear a veil. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more about that or pick up on anything else that you want to, to address. Um, in, in your uh, what, the last minute to you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Naidu. Um, that's a good, good question. I think the epistemic violence of of the veil, uh, sadly, continues, and it's it's um, it, it's something that um, you know. After I we published Framing Muslims, the editor wanted me to to pursue a project on the veil to, to pursue a book on the veil and I said look I don't want to to write on the veil because um, I think I want to move beyond that conversation I um, I don't have much um, new stuff to say that hasn't been said already but I you know the the, the kind of reactions and the recognitions that continue to be engendered through it and in terms of the normalization in society that it, it remains in European society a, a kind of fetish I think and the inclusivity question around for example visible Muslim identity becomes very much around uh, how uh, the veil is structured in that performativity of identity as well so I think, you know, there, there's the veil that Fanon talks about in relation to Algeria. There's the veil that is um, um, practiced in, um, in the mosques in um, Cairo that um, Sabah Mahmoud talks about. And then there is uh, the veil that has been the subject of um, disagreement over citizenship and belonging in Europe in, in terms, you know, from Fran over discussions of laicite in France and the fact that you cannot, you know, you are not being part of a model of citizenship that is required in modern day democracy. So it seems to me that we just, you know, it all, all kind of keeps coming back around that, that sort of woman, um, a passive identification and doesn't allow us to move beyond uh, much more thoughts and ideas. I mean, I I, w I thought there were so many intersectionalities and, and contexts here. And with regards to Islamic feminism, I, I want to use feminism and, and, you know, the, in relation to the idea of decolonization, I'm very conscious that there is not one particular idea of feminism and that, that so many people here are providing the labor you know in pedagogy in in sort of um resistance in thinking through you know the i the church uh, the space uh, spiritual spaces non-spiritual spaces um body shaming and uh just just general not being able to um to to talk about the trauma that is part of uh, of the process of um, 
women's lives here that have that have been and I think there's a lot that we can gain from our transnational connections and conversations and I really hope that this is the beginning of of something much much bigger because I've I've learned really quite a lot from these sessions and and thoughts and ideas that I will continue to reflect on so I hope that sort of answers your question um Actually, yes, thank you. And, and the word fetish, I think, sums it up and fixation on, on what uh, discourse popular and otherwise uh, chooses to, to fixate on. Uh, we have to end here because we have encroached and eroded into the keynotes, but it's a beautiful, thank you so much to, to all the speakers, the panelists. Uh, I didn't come back to Vivian because uh, she opened with the, a response to, to one of the questions. Thank you, everybody. But this is a beautiful, seamless dovetail into the keynote. And we really, uh, uh, we know that you're going to want to remain here because they will pick up a lot of the, the provocative sort of ends of questions that, that were raised here or, or surfaced and congealed here. Um, so I want to uh, lead you to the keynote uh, conversationalist, Owina and uh, Desiree. They're both in gender studies. Owina is in uh, gender in SOAS, the reader there. And Desiree Lewis is from University of Western Cape. And who better to lead us and continue this discussion and well, conversation around um, decolonization and uh, feminism uh, resistances. Uh, resistance came up a lot in all the, the talks. And hopefully, some of those can be peeled back in this conversation as well. So thank you so much to all the speakers. I hand over now to Owina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahesh. And uh, absolutely, I hope folks are staying because we are going to have what I imagine will be a very, very exciting conversation, largely because we are going to be listening to somebody I consider to be one of the most erudite, preeminent feminist scholars whose work I have immensely benefited from when I was a student as, and also as I continue to teach in my current job. So Professor Desiree Lewis is in the Women and Gender Studies Department at the University of the Western Cape. She has published and taught on the subject of Black and post-colonial feminist knowledge making for roughly three decades. Some of her much more recent work include Neoliberalism and Feminism in the South African Academy, Epistemic Ruptures in South African Standpoint, Knowledge Making, Academic Feminism, and the Fees Must Fall Movement, and Governmentality and South Africa's Edifice of Gender and Sexual Rights. Lewis's recent work on food as material culture seeks to expand the radical possibilities of feminist knowledge making through post-colonial critiques of the Anthropocene. She's currently the lead PI, uh, that is a key investigator of a super institutional program funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation titled Critical Food Studies, Humanities Approaches to Food and Food Systems. As was suggested, this is an in-conversation keynote. So Desiree and I are going to be dialoguing around three major questions. And then we are definitely going to be opening up for an engagement with the Q&A, just as was done in the previous panel. Desiree, welcome. How are you doing? Let's start there. I'm fine, Owena. I mean, it's good to see you, even though virtually. Yeah, no, I'm welcome. Thanks. Good to see you too. So yesterday I was part of a conversation or a panel on, uh, on decolonizing and Africanizing knowledge. And one of the things that struck me about that conversation was a kind of erasure, if you will, or, or around the trajectory or the historiography, if you want to think of it like that, of decolonizing knowledge and where feminisms or African feminist scholars sit in this conversation. Often when we talk about the big names, they're often male names, uh, somehow we don't feature in this conversation. So take us through, if you will, a mapping of where African feminists or black feminists fit in this conversation. Mm. Yeah, as you say, the, the names that are recognized, the names that are publicized, the names that are cited, the names that pop up when we do Google searches are the names of male authors. These are the founding father figures in decolonial knowledge making. Um, and paradoxically, I think it's very paradoxical that it's the gendered constructs that we know that we have become so ubiquitous that structure how we think about the world and ourselves. These are the constructs that are actually legacies of colonial knowledge making and colonial categorization. 
So the failure to acknowledge gender and what Maria Lugones calls the coloniality of gender is a glaring omission in any effort to counter colonial epistemology. And yeah, if feminism is peripheral in popularized understandings of decolonizing knowledge, African feminist knowledge making is especially marginalized. African feminists have been seen as those whose contributions are practical, concrete, and not theoretical, philosophical, epistemological, and of re relevance to humanity as a whole. And I think this is connected to commonsensical understandings of knowledge, including decolonial knowledge. Um, colonial categories curate very rigidly knowledge that is deemed to be universally valuable. Even among many who seek to challenge colonialism, um, we find the persistence of binaries like practice versus theorizing, embodied action versus cognitive thought, narration or expression versus interpretation. And these are the binaries that regulate what we understand as knowledge that really matters. And of course, this categorization disparages very rich traditions, uh, including pre-colonial ones of African women's oriture, their leadership dating back several centuries, or more recently, their agencies in boycotts and protests, or their life narratives, autobiographies, and storytelling. Yet African women have always created and disseminated epistemologies for guiding the counter-colonial evolution of societies believed to have no histories. Um, African feminists such as Ifi Amadiyume and Oyoronka Oyerumi have tried to excavate this rich legacy and to signal its emancipatory potential for guiding post-colonial futures. They show how the rigid gendered struggle of gendered categories through which we think about ourselves have been historically shaped and that drawing on different legacies is vital to reimagining socially just, peaceful and non-exploitative worlds and value systems. Um, I think it's certainly true that there is a great deal of diversity and unevenness in the politics and thought that's been defined as African feminism. But despite this, we can see African feminist knowledge as offering a standpoint that speaks back, uh, kind of seeing the network of colonialism, patriarchy, and neoliberal capitalism from below, which is something that's also shared in transnational, by uh, transnational feminism. And I think it's important that this breadth in standpoint um, was evident in women's, African women's very early involvement in nationalism. Um, these were entangled struggles. They were rooted in a standpoint knowledge of how intricately layers of power work. Um, we really do fail to do, to do justice to struggles to shift power when we hierarchize different forms of injustice or see them as layers requiring intervention one at a time. This is evident in the conclusions of Western-centric feminist assessments of African women in nationalism. African women were seen as not being feminists because they resisted colonialism alongside men and focused on class or racialized struggles, or because they were seen to not articulate gendered struggles clearly. The term intersectionality has of course become de rigueur in many celebrations of decoloniality, but for centuries, radical women leaders, activists, and thinkers who never used the term negotiated complex entanglements of power and violence. So I think just by way of positioning African feminism, that's that's the way I that's the way I do it. Now, one of the, the pieces uh, that you wrote that I keep on returning to again and again was the one on African gender research and post-coloniality. What mm -hmm. challenges did you raise with that particular article? And if you look back now, 10 or so years later, even more, what challenges uh, do we still continue to confront or do you perceive at this current moment? Mm -hmm. I think then I was, and I remain interested in, and this came up in the discussion in the panel, uh, the abiding decolonizing impulse to dismantle hegemonic knowledge. Um, some may feel, and I find this very much among impatient students who want decolonial knowledge now. For me, the idea of decolonizing knowledge as an ongoing project is essential. Uh, I think to kind of imagine that there's going to be some miraculous moment beyond that. Yeah, 
um, it's, it, it just becomes very troubling. So some feel that this emphasis on dismantling locks us into deconstruction without construction, that there should be a stronger focus on producing new knowledge. But this belief does simplify the controlling impact of dominant knowledge systems. So the influential decolonial thought of Edward Said, Franz Fanon, B.Y. Mudimbe painstakingly excavates colonial tropes, narratives, myths, and icons as a necessary and crucial process of discursive space clearing. And this discursive space clearing is essential. Um, and in the uh, publication that you referred to, I focused on African feminist critiques of the colonial archive. And one argument was that the seemingly progressive ways of writing African women into history are in fact profoundly oppressive. African women were made hyper-visible in this work only as exploited and victimized pawns in stories about others. And my argument was influenced by Chandramanti's highly influential critique of the flood of Western-centric writing about third world women in under-Western eyes. And the argument is that what is colonial about certain knowledge making is not that it is overtly hostile and violent or writes third world women out. On the contrary, uh, it makes them hyper-visible, but entrenches stereotypes about marginalized groups embeddedness in static cultures, traditional families, and other worlds. In other words, it makes them hyper-visible as ciphers and invisible as human subjects. And yeah, this paradox definitely persists uh, in the global imaginary today. An anthropological gaze perpetuates the colonial script that these subjects can be imagined only as victims, as those who must be saved, as those locked into a defunct and valueless pastness. African feminism displaces these myths and the levels, they operate at multiple levels. So for example, in pursuing the deconstructive impulse of decolonizing, Patricia McFadden unpacks the enduring impact of what she calls old European appropriation practices of studying Africa. And she registers how early colonial ethnography set in place a formula for the ongoing representation of African women in research, in policy making, and even activism, often among Africans, um, which you know gets back to my point about the, the absolutely important need to excavate and unravel in order to do undo the damage that not, is, is not only out there, but is also in here. And of course, the political, the epistemic violence here is not a result of the political motivations of writers or the advocates of this discourse, but a consequence of how entrenched the anthropological apparatus has been and continues to be. Um, so yeah, McFadden's arguments made several years ago still apply. Currently, coronial stereotypes about women, African women being trapped by tradition requiring the liberation promised by rights discourses and colonial modernity being supplicants in relation to Northern aid and rescue narratives flood our conceptual world. They are evident in digital media, newspaper reports, seemingly progressive popular culture and rights discourses and, and, and advocacy. And they are promoted with particular force in the visual texts that have now become such important conduits of dominant discourses. It's actually incredible how persistent the visual image of voiceless passive ravaged and burdened African woman, a victim of disease, poverty and tradition continues to be. It is also incredible how resilient the view is of Africa as being in particular need of rescue and um, salvation. Um, yeah, a connected African feminist response to the colonial archive is the critique of development discourse and practice. Radical African women have condemned the brutal duplicity of development and modernization discourses for decades. They have done so as activists, as intellectuals, in and outside the academy, and as working women who directly experience the exploitative violence of development's underbelly. Development and modernization discourses try to dragoon multiply subordinate groups into the colonial economy. Contrary to their claims to uplift such groups, they erode all vestiges of the indigenous or hard-won agency of subordinate groups. For example, through prescriptions about how to produce and manage food or how to build peace and security 
or how to use and manage land, and even about how to organize themselves. Through globalized instruments and technologies, technologies that include the United Nations and the World Bank, and also often through Northern aid and rights advocacy, development and modernization are touted as panaceas for the suffering of the colonized and formerly colonized. Um, and I think it's really important that development practice um, is maintained discursively and coercively in the present day. Um, and increasingly African solutions have come to be associated with specialized, rational and scientific knowledge with the wisdom of experts and consultants, the brittle and technocratic technologies of audits, auditing and top-down measurement that we see today. And more and more local, indigenous and often women-centered practice and knowledge come to be coded as inefficient, atavistic and regressive. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that the classic development paradigm from the 50s to the 70s has morphed into something more seductive, um, into sort of more neoliberal and populist technologies. But the development paradigm persists, even though its framing may have become more cautious and less obviously prescriptive. Um, it's infiltrated seemingly African-centered activism and thought, much of which now relays the policies, goals, strategies, and policies, and yeah, policies prescribed by the North. Much of the work of governments, policymakers, policy researchers, and academics routinely involves subjecting the fate of the colonized to scrutiny, measurement, and intervention. And often at the face of the African woman is the face of the colonized with a view to their transformation into efficient and disciplined contributors to the global economy. Um, yeah, development discourse has expanded into a terrifying arsenal, often normalized among and within ostensibly progressive organizations of prescription, dogmas, networks, field expertise, and knowledge specialization, of measuring where African women are at according to externally defined goals that must be met, of defining and monitoring the progress they must make. The discursive tools for, Afri for regulating African women's upliftment epitomizes the current imperial knowledge making and surveillance apparatus. Basically, this is an internationally ratified form of bullying. Thank you very much, Desiree. You know, uh, some of your earlier points remind me of Everjoyce's, uh, Everjoyce Wynn's 2004 piece or not very poor or powerless or pregnant, you know, and you will not believe the number of times I speak somewhere and people say, but what about the real African woman? Uh, which makes me wonder often, what am I uh, if uh, not a real African woman? But moving yeah. along, you know, uh, from my perch here in London, some of the key debates that are circulating within feminist circles, but also that are concerning to feminist and gender studies centers, you know, are this anti, uh, you know, extreme right conversations around gender ideology, you know, the sort of erasures that are accompanying, you know, a lot of the, the scholarship, the movement building work that has led us to a place where certain things are no longer struggles that we that we think about the place, the public private divide, you know, the place of, uh, of women in public spaces, etc. From where you're seated, uh, what do you see as some of the continuing uh, contemporary challenges that feminist scholars, intellectuals, and movement builders need to continue to grapple with in, in a much more concerted way. Mm. I think what I, I, I would flag neoliberalism, um, which is now fully aligned with neo-imperialism and which works in tandem with developmentalism, but I think it's worth discussing separately. Um, and the devastating impact of structural adjustment has long been central to African feminist intersectional analysis. Um, and as has been shown, um, the structural adjustment offers to deliver African countries from ruin, but most definitely does not do so. Uh, feminists have exposed the myth that structural adjustment leads to development and growth. Um, but what seems to me important is that neoliberal neoliberalism's role as a subject constituting process hasn't extended as far as it could. Um, neoliberalism is both an economic system 
with exploitative and trading effects on third world countries and a system of governmentality. Its reach globally has led specialist knowledge to be harnessed to the imperatives of the market. And this has profoundly affected the status and role of higher education. Um, traditionally, the mission of the universities has been to undertake research and to teach uh, priorities that have led them, laid them open to charges of elitism. Um, with the emphasis on a third mission in neoliberal planning, university teaching and research have been yoked to the academy's direct engagement with economic growth activities. And for me, there are two implications of this instrumentalizing of knowledge and of implications that have been flagged uh, within African feminist thought and practice. One is that knowledge capital comes to serve the centers uh, of global capitalism directly or indirectly. For example, relations around academic research come to mirror those associated with the extraction and processing of material commodities such as food. So the concentration of expertise, research specialization and resources in the North coexists with and feeds off the data gathering in the South. Knowledge expertise, especially as this concerns multiply subordinated subjects like African women, comes to follow a colonial logic. Put simply, and as Amina Mama and Sylvia Tamale, among others have shown, the knowledge of subordinate groups is plundered and expertise and authority is consolidated in the North. And it's important to stress that this exercise of colonial authority has a benign face. In fact, it is presented as a progressive or decolonizing act, since the argument is that knowledge about other groups is disrupting the center. And this, this leads to a connected point, uh, which is that working towards knowledge inclusion is often seen as the solution to global knowledge imbalances. As though the main problem here is that everyone should have equal access to the center. Yet all centers, insofar as these exist, are exclusionary and authoritarian. The strategies of gatekeeping, peer reviewing, accreditation and publishing are never neutral, as African feminists have been insisting for years when they seek to establish independent networks, journals and publishing ventures within Africa. Centers work concertedly to keep certain kinds of ideas, knowledges, and viewpoints out. They also work to reinforce structures, mechanisms, and positions of power at the center. So in our efforts to decolonize knowledge, we cannot afford to ignore the way in which the decolonial knowledge-making machine can itself be instrumentalized. Um, and I think a related point is to note that, and I think this might have come up in, in previous discussions, neoliberalism drives a particular intensity in field specialization and competitiveness. Um, in our neoliberal universities, academics are held captive by the neoliberal principle, which is naturalized as a norm, that to consolidate a field, to claim expert expertise in such a field, to garner funding for and to have a demonstrable impact in the field is a marker of excellence. It is grounds for survival in a marketplace of knowledge we're making where you simply have to prove you're the expert according to the standards of the center. Progressive commentators on a neoliberal knowledge economy have shown how easily radical sites of knowledge production can become commodified. Bodies of theorizing and research enter the market of the knowledge industry as objects of consumption rather than as conduits in activism. So Chandra Mahanti notes that the making of a space for radical knowledge, for example, feminism or African feminism, is often fully in line with the neoliberal project of multiculturalism. This incorporation leaves intact the structures, relationships and assumptions of radical um, knowledge contexts. It also shuts down on any questions about these structures, since they seem to actually welcome the idea of a truly democratic knowledge commons. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pause there for you. Do you have any comments to offer in relation to knowledge making that sits outside of institutions, outside of the university? Mm, yeah. Um, 
I suppose, again, asking the question, how do we really take seriously? It's not so much a recommendation or a prescription, but it's circling back to what I spoke about at the start. How do we really take seriously the ontologies and epistemologies produced outside of institutions, such as universities or research sites? Um, I remarked on these, as I said, at the start. And I, I think it's important to stress their particular relevance uh, in the context of the ecological collapse that is the legacy of extractivist colonialism and capitalism. The anthropocentric plundering of our environment alongside the brutal exploitation of colonized groups is rooted in anthropocentric knowledge systems that perceive nature and the non-human only as resources for privileged groups. This colonization of the environment has worked alongside the colonization of certain human bodies and gives new meaning to what we understand by colonial practice and epistemic violence. In the academic scramble to lay claim to new radical ways of knowing in the North, a new industry, the tradition of post-humanism sets out to critique this anthropocentrism. And I'm referring you to thinkers like Donna Haraway, Rosie Bradotti, and Jane Bent, among many others, uh, but these are the feminists. And their emphasis on matter as a gentle repudiates the anthropocentric belief that matter is inert and exists only to be instrumentalized by humans. Yet, their modes of knowing are incredibly neglectful of the ontologies um, and epistemologies that have long guided pre-colonial and indigenous relations to nature and the non-human. Explicitly or implicitly disparaged as primitive animism, indigenous knowledges, which are often associated with women's engagement with nature, have been sidelined in the specialized and elitist work of posthumous intellectuals in the North. Um, the feminist that I've discovered recently, Joanita Sandberg, confronts this in reflecting on her own blind spots as a post-colonial feminist Southern, from South America. And she asks, why did I not seek out scholarship rooted in non-dualistic epistemic traditions? Indigenous authors in Americas, for instance, outlined complex knowledge systems wherein plants, animals, and spirits are understood as beings who participate in the everyday practices that bring worlds into being. These epistemic traditions are not organized in and through dualist ontologies of nature culture. Which is basically saying that centuries before the recent growth of traditions of post-humanism, African women's, well, indigenous women's knowledge making, as well as their work and spiritual practice repudiated um, anthropo the anthropocentrism of our current work. Sylvia Tamale, who's recently produced a book on decolonization and African Afrofeminism, um, also acknowledges this. She talks about Africa's ecocentric worldview, which was, and she says, rather obtusely acknowledged by the world when Kenyan feminist Wangari Maathai was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for a contribution to sustainable development. And she goes on to talk about the epistemic relationship between indigenous people and nature, which is manifested through their spirituality, ancestral myths, rituals, fables, and so on. She goes on to say that these complex, complex sets of traditional belief govern the conduct of indigenous communities. Indeed, they constituted self-enforcing institutions that did not require state to regulate or compel um, submission. So Tamale identifies these early eco-feminist traditions. And um, I think there are two other African feminists that I would like to mention who are deepening this and both are combining practice as farmers with knowledge production. These are Yvette Abrams and Pat McFadden. And I think what is important about their work is the way in which they gesture towards what I suppose one could see as a, a level in the intersectional decolonizing of knowledge. Um, as they show, and as generations of African women before them have shown, expansive freedoms can be imagined by discrediting hierarchical differences among human subjects and also through knowledges that offer liberating ways of seeing and being in relation to the earth. 
Thank you very much for that, Desiree. A final one from me, mm. which is the omnipresence of women as the subject of African feminist knowledge production. Where are we on that? Where are we? You cited, you know, Amadi Ume and Oyeronke initially when you began in terms of their key contributions to destabilizing uh, this idea of sex mapping onto gender in, in the sort of very rigid ways that, you know, early feminist work from the West, you know, led us to think, to say that there were different traditions of thinking about gender across the Nigerian context, which they were writing about, the Igbos and the Yorubas. So the omnipresence of the woman as the subject of feminism, your thoughts? Well, I think the omnipresence, when you say that, I'm assuming you mean the reduction of thinking uh, conceptually about certain categories in trying to deconstruct categories by using those categories themselves. Um, Look, I think that there are, they are, they have obviously been interventions and more recently, I think the focus on um, thinking about the fluidity, which is, uh, you know, something that is part of traditional epistemology of sexual orientation, of ideas about gender, has become much more widespread and has interestingly been connected to um, global trends where there's been another kind of consolidating and shoring up of, of fixed identities. So I think what's happening at the moment is the surfacing of debates about what the problem really is. Is it about not being able to claim identities or is it or should it be about that system of identification in the first place? It's a very complex uh, debate and it's you know, it's affecting, yeah, activists globally, um, but it's, it, it's a hard debate that we all need to have. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but it's kind of, yeah, I've responded to what I think you might have asked. No, absolutely. That's, that's, that's exactly what I was asking us to, to collectively reflect on and think with. Uh, about categories, what those do, what they don't do, what they take us back to as well. Mm. Uh, the feminist project of liberation, emancipation, and, um, and the categories that you know patriarchy uh, reproduces as part of limiting those freedoms, mm. liberation mm. Uh, possibilities. Mm. So there's a question on the chat around, um, I'm curious to know where this person is writing from. But I'll read the question. How do we assert our perspectives as African feminist scholars in our research without having to constantly defend it or assert its scientific relevance? I'm really curious where you're writing from, but that's the question, Desiree. Mm. I suppose I try to speak to that by talking about um, the importance of dismantling the framing in the first place. So the question to ask is whose notion of scientific relevance, even the idea of science, um, you know, science which is defined as definitive authoritative knowledge, which is generally positivist. Um, positivist knowledge is not necessarily superior to other kinds of knowledge. In fact, to the contrary, it usually shuts down on possibility and uncertainty, which as we know, is always uh, an inescapable part of life. At the same time, I think the question comes from realizing that the hierarchy, the hierarchy in which we, we operate, in which we work, the hierarchizing of universities of knowledge is very real. And one does constantly have to insist on the relevance, the importance, the value of certain forms of knowledge. But I would say certainly not, um, not a, you know, it should certainly not be accompanied by measuring up to, because that really is a betrayal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, add to that by, I think, asserting that I think our job as, as, as scholars and, well, this is from South Africa, okay, from Seoul, KQ University in Kimberley. I think there's there's a big problem in university spaces around you know setting up the canon and then you know following that up with uh, you know more recent scholarship, which um, you know there are multiple ways to think creatively and expansively about who you're centering as part of your knowledge making processes, which I think all of us as academics need to encourage 
our students and, and the spaces that we occupy to think much more expansively around that rather than consistently reproducing the same voices again and again and again. Uh, there seem to be no more questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to ask you a final set uh, of, of reflections, if you will. So you, you say that your current project is around rethinking food systems. And uh, if could you share a little bit more about that, that project and what is it that you're seeking to, to do in the course of that work? Yeah, I think um, for me, what is uh, important here is the, the fact that food has been written about and explored in third world context mainly in terms of bread and butter issues, and precisely in terms of you know, paradigms of development and modernization that we think about. So the dominant world food system has a huge kind of edifice of um, knowledge that reinforces the idea that the North needs to save the rest of the world from starvation and what? Um, and this goes hand in glove with a ways of modifying seed, a ways of managing the land with big food systems, with capitalist agriculture. So a lot of the work about food, in other words, falls into this paradigm, this food security, so-called food security paradigm. And the notion of security is itself problematic. Um, I'm a humanities scholar. My field is literary studies. Um, and when I say to people that I'm interested in food, they do kind of think, oh, why? Um, but this is not a social science or development studies or agricultural science approach to food. And it's a attempt to use food to think about power relations, gendered relations, the construction of identities, the cultural and social meanings attached to food, the women's roles that are often disparaged. Um, so it's, it's in a sense using food as a way to open up quite a few of the um, insights that I've tried to raise, including, for example, what is indigenous knowledge? Mm -hmm. How does it open us up to ways of being, ways of thinking about ourselves and our relations to one another and a surrounding world in ways that truly counter um, the violence associated with what we inherit from colonialism? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Desiree. Uh, as we come to a close of what I found to be a very enriching uh, keynote, and I hope that those who have attended have also benefited from this conversation, including, you know, clarifying, tying together some of the conversations that began in the initial panel, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, religion, spirituality, thinking about the university site and, and our role as academics within that. My final question to you is really to offer your set of closing reflections or thoughts around conversations on decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production processes. I find that, you know, the more we have these conversations, the more people get confused about what is it that we are inherently asking for when we're saying decolonize knowledge? What is it that we are seeking to do in that process? So if you wanted to offer some clarifying feminist interventions around <laughs> what decolonizing knowledge production from an African feminist perspective, but also just from, from a much more broadly feminist perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as I've said, it definitely involves looking at a range of power dynamics and taking very seriously the context in which we have conversations, um, the way in which knowledge making, including critical knowledge and the debates themselves are taken up and used. I think we sometimes simplify um, the, or, or, or underplay the extent to which knowledge functions in terms of a broader economy um, where ideas are instrumentalized, ideas are used, not because people are deliberately manipulating them, but because they enter into a certain kind of circuit. Um, so here yeah, to be constantly vigilant and to be open to critique and listening to each other. And um, yeah, one of the things that I have found, and I suppose this is true of myself when I was young, but I do find that there's an impatience um, that young students have had. Um, and I, 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 we cannot afford impatience. We certainly need critique, we need animation, but we also need to be really, really vigilant. Yeah. And I think one of the, th the beautiful things that your presentation has done today is also to point uh, to the importance of this transnational knowledge building conversation. Um, 
you know, to recognize knowledge production processes that are happening in the global south? And how do we think collectively with that knowledge without always looking, uh, uh, you know, to the US or, or, you know, to the European landscape as the basis uh, from which to draw on feminist knowledge production uh, and feminist intellectual knowledge? Colleagues, uh, please join me once again in thanking Desiree for making the time. These are complex times for all of us. And I know we are setting aside uh, space to think collectively in a moment that has also captured us um, in very difficult and complex ways, COVID-19 and you know, all of the, the losses and the mental health complications that also arise with being in isolation, lockdown and managing curfews. So we do not uh, underestimate uh, your presence here. Uh, we hope that you're keeping safe and taking care of yourselves and your families and your minds and your hearts and your bodies. After all, that is what the feminist project is about. Our bodies and our minds and our hearts and souls are totally connected to the work of freedom and justice that, that we're seeking to do and the worlds we're seeking to change. Self-care, collective care, be attentive to that in this moment. Asante Nisana, Asante Sana Desiree for making the time. The next panel begins at 12.45. Please log on for that. And But as we sign out, I believe we are going to be treated to some lovely music. So if you want to hang around for that, please do. Desiree, be well, take care. Thank you, Awina. Thank you very much to the organizers. All right, thanks.